the Pragmatic Luther back again. I thought I'd do a follow-up video today from the one I did yesterday on ripping on a table saw. Today I'm going to cover cross-cutting. This is, in my opinion at least, a much safer operation, but still a lot of care has to be taken. So we'll turn off Cheryl Wheeler in the background and we'll get started. Okay, I've got the camera set up close to the blade and down where you can see real well, same as I did with the ripping video. And I think the first thing I want to say about cross-cutting on a table saw is you see the fence, get it the hell out of the way. One of the things that you never do, and I can't repeat this enough times, you never use a miter gauge and a rip fence at the same time, except under certain circumstances, which I'll get to momentarily. First things first, you cross cut on a table saw with a miter gauge of some type. This is a slick exotic one. I'm going to show you a simpler one later on. The first thing I want to do is make sure that my miter gauge is perfectly square to that saw blade. And I want to do that. I don't know if you can see this, but I want my square blade to touch a tooth at the front and at the back. I don't want to compare by the saw plate because the saw plate may have been doctored by the manufacturer, which means it's not exactly flat. Uh, I don't know that for sure. It probably depends on the blade. But go from tooth to tooth to square up. And after you do that, make a cut to make a test and test the piece to make sure that it is in fact square and adjust from there. It's always a good practice. Pardon me for leaving the camera. Okay, so with my slick exotic miter gauge, which, let me explain. This is an expensive miter gauge. Um, I bought this because this is adjustable in tenths of a degree, which in my work in guitar making becomes extremely useful. But you don't need anything this complex. In fact, sometimes I really wonder why I bought this thing. It's it's fancy, but fancy doesn't make for excellent work. So what do we need to do when we cross cut a piece of wood? It's pretty simple. We need to make sure that the edge that we're guiding against, and before I go any further, as I mentioned in the video about ripping, I said we're cutting parallel to the longest edge of the workpiece when we rip. Well, it's also true that we always guide against the longest edge of a workpiece, no matter what we do. It's the longest edge that we use to bear against and guide from. So that edge needs to be in good shape, meaning it needs to be perfectly straight. If you don't have a jointed edge, you're not gonna get a square cut, that's bad enough. But to make matters worse, I don't have a really crooked piece here, but if the piece that you wanna cross cut is convexed on the edge that bears against the miter gauge, it can rock back and forth. And if it does that, then it is no longer traveling in a path parallel to the plane of rotation of the blade, and it can pinch, kick back, and hurt you. And I think you're, you know, if your hands are up close and that happens, you're more likely to get hurt. So don't let that happen. Always use a straight edge against your miter gauge and a flat surface. If the piece rocks back and forth, no good. That's It's never going to serve you well. And keep in mind that you can't do accurate work if your material is not properly prepared to be squared up and then cut to length or multiple lengths or whatever you want to do. So really, it's just this simple. I'm going to do a very quick demonstration of a cut at random, and then we'll get down to a couple of other particulars that might help you along a little bit. So I don't need to worry too much about stance here. I don't need to make sure that I'm to the right or left of the blade necessarily. But in order to make your miter gauge work well for you, stand right behind it. Keep your hands well back from it. And just guide your work through smoothly all the way past the back of the saw blade. Uh, I think it's a good idea to just, if you can, pull your workpiece back away from the blade. Not super necessary, but if you can get a hold of it to do that, it probably wouldn't hurt. 
So here we go, a quick one. Uh, your fingers are in, your fingers are away from the blade, you're holding your material down and you're holding it in against your miter gauge fence. <laughs> Now you'll notice that I did not pull back on this piece and there was a good reason. I don't have a good grip on it. I can't make it slide. I'm not gonna reach over here, obviously. So you're better off to just hold on and bring it back. I did not touch this piece and I don't want to. That's too dangerous. Don't ever reach in there. You could, I suppose, if it's really necessary, you could reach in with a long stick and move it away but I wouldn't even bother because if this piece is not where it can be trapped anywhere, it's probably never going to hurt you. Now, what if I want to cut multiples? Very simple. When you got a slick exotic miter gauge like this one, you can just set this up and there's increments. I'm not going to show you all of this stuff, but there are increments and a scale here that you can calibrate and you can put this down and it's really cool. Because if I want to square this end and then cut this established length, I do it just this way. I lift this. Now I have a square end. I can turn that, put that against my stop. And now I can cut multiple. And you'll notice I reached over and grabbed that, but I did it because this piece is a good eight and a quarter inches long. I'm not afraid to reach over there and pull that away. If I'm in here four, three, four, five inches away, nah, probably not. Just let it coast to a stop. It is a good idea to clear chips and small pieces out of the way because just the wind that the saw generates can get confused in there and sometimes they'll hit and kick out. They probably won't do much damage, but it's a good idea to keep those cleared out of the way. So cutting angles is pretty much the same thing. You're just going to rotate your gauge at an angle, but do keep in mind that as you rotate your miter gauge to an angle, uh, you need good friction with your workpiece to stay against the fence of the miter gauge. Otherwise, it may tend to slide on you, and it, and it will sometimes. And if your blade is not perfectly clean, it's effectively not as sharp and it can actually cause that movement just a little bit. So do be careful when you're cutting angles. I've glued uh, some sandpaper on this miter gauge. It helps keep your material still uh, and you could do that with any miter gauge that you have. Let's look at a simpler one. I have the miter gauge that came with the saw this is the, the Delta gauge that came with this saw 22 years ago. And all I did was I put a fence on this. And this is very, very handy because you can make these up in any length you want. You can make them cross the blade if they stick up far enough so that they cross the blade. They can end some support over here if you were to need it for some reason. You can take them off, throw them away, and modify them any way you want. And you can make them any length. If you have one that's too short, you could, I suppose, even put a longer stick on there to get extra length out of it. What about, what about cutting multiples? You can cut multiples even with a simple uh, fence and miter gauge like this. I just made up this block. I've had this for... Uh, 30 years. It's just one block screwed to another so that it hangs on here. And I just use a two inch clamp to clamp that down. And you can make any cuts you want. And this is really very, very accurate because by measuring between the left side of a tooth and that block, you can get cuts that are just absolutely wonderful. And you can, if you want to take the time on this top edge, you could make a zero cut, which I'm going to do right now. I made this long enough so that the blade is going to hit it the first time I make a cut. So I'm going to do that. Right 
Okay, now I know that that's the zero end of that fence. If I wanted to, I could very carefully make marks at specific increments down that top edge. Now it would be hard, admittedly, to make them absolutely precise, and I question the value of that, but to make a mark every inch, every half inch, or even every quarter of an inch, and number them, it would give you a rough idea where you are, so that if you just need to get a block off something that needs to be at least this length, whack it off, and then do something else with it. Now I mentioned earlier in the video that you never want to use the rip fence and the miter gauge together. And that is predominantly true. And especially when you're making cross cuts. Uh, if you were to do something like rabbits, there may be a circumstance where you could use the fence as a guide because you're not cutting all the way through the material. But even there, you need to be extremely, extremely careful. And I don't generally recommend it. There are, however, rare circumstances where you need the workpiece to fall on the waist side of the blade. This is normally where your workpiece is. And you can do this with one provision. You can see the rip fence is now in play. I certainly would never want to bring a workpiece up against that fence and use that as a length stop because that's going to catch material between the blade and the fence and that blade is going to try and rotate that away from the, the fence and it's going to come out of there, it's going to ruin the work, you're going to get badly hurt. However, I could by using a stop that goes against the fence, I could possibly make that cut if I have this dimension established now between this point and the right side of the blade I could make that cut but there are some provisions uh, that being that this stop you want to make sure this comes out of the way and you never want the stop in between the blade and the fence you always want it behind the behind the blade behind the front edge that way when material is cut off it's free to move out of the way of the blade or you could even reach and pull it over if you've got enough distance in there where you can reach in safely. So that is another way that you could make those cuts. And you can do this with you know, a block of wood. This happens to be high molecular weight polyethylene, but you could do it even with a, with a strong magnet over here, I suppose. But no matter what you use, it has to be behind the front of that blade at all times. It's the only safe way you can do that. I have one other thing that I want to show you. And that is this large cutoff slab. Now there's got to be at least two dozen or more uh, designs for cutoff sleds of all kinds. I know you can make them that ride in, in both of the uh, gauge slots in the table and they've got a big arch on them so that they don't come apart. Personally, uh, I've never built one. I've never used one except for a fretting device that I use. And I, I use that one because you're only cutting about you know, 60 or 70 thousandths deep, so it's not a big deal. But I think cutoff sleds are very handy to a point. Now, I want you to notice, I'm going to turn the camera for you a little bit here. You can see how long this sled happens to be. That's a good thing because it gives me a lot of surface for my material to rest on. And this allows me to make a wider cut. You see, I can, I can cut off a board that's as much as 18 inches wide or so. The downside is it's heavy out here. And you have to be careful of that. The upside, on the other hand, is that I put a T-track in this. You don't need a T-track. You could use the same stop block technique I showed you before. I just did this because it was kind of fun. And I did put one inch increments down the edge of this so that I can make rough cuts and then refine from there. So it does have its uses, but you have to be very careful about that propensity for that to tip. Should you ever build one of these, please keep that in mind. Lastly, a warning about cutting off very long, very thick, and very wide stock. 
I'm going to turn the camera again and you can see that this piece of four by four that I'm putting up as an example extends quite a ways beyond the edge of my table. And we know, obviously, its weight is out there, so it's going to want to tip up. That increases your danger by an awful lot. If that jumps up, it's just going to raise hell in there and somebody's going to get hurt. So I recommend that when you have long stock, wide stock, heavy stock, um, and even if it extends a long ways out on this side of the gauge, if, it's, if the weight is supported, you're a lot safer. But you have to be very careful with these things because if anything drags or tilts, it can be nothing but trouble. For things like this, get yourself a good miter saw or even set up a handheld circular saw with a guide of some kind or even cut it off rough with a, with a circular saw and then re-square it up in smaller billets on your table saw or your miter saw. It's, it's just much safer in the end. So there's cross cutting on the table saw. I think it's a little easier than ripping and it's a little bit less dangerous, but by all means, take all the precautions you need to take to work safely and work accurately. Lastly, I wanna remind you that what you saw on my table saw was no splitters and no guards. That's for your visibility so that you can understand what I'm showing you. I'm not advocating that you set up your saw the way mine is set up. I uh, certainly think it's a good idea to have things like the new saw stop technology if you can manage to afford that for yourself. Splitters, if they're a good one, are always a good idea. And of course, guards should be in place. So please do not construe what you saw in this video as me recommending that you set your saw up the way I have mine. That's not the point. Still, work safely, enjoy your woodwork, Thanks for watching. I hope you'll put a like on the video and I hope you'll subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching.